it I see the the option at the bottom of the uh, yeah I just clicked it it should be recording now all right awesome yeah, I'm gonna put myself on mute okay. yeah I'll be on mute uh, when you when you speak as well that's cool uh, if you are uh, if we are recording it then if we are recording it, then we can um, send the send the video out in the via email. Hey, Brent. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. How are you, Brent? Thanks for joining us. You betcha, man. Uh, did I, uh, it's seven, right? Yeah, correct. Yep. Okay, we, good. Sorry, I missed your call today. Hey, no, no big deal whatsoever. I think I'm going to be there. Sorry. Now I have to figure it out how to, because when I have my laptop on, my phone actually rings through the, I have to go in settings probably. Tell you what, I'm just gonna turn off the phone. All right, somebody's moving the computer or the iPad around. <laughs> You might yeah. have the TV. What? You might have the TV a little bit too loud because we can hear. Well, I'm going to shut the doors. Okay. Thank I'll you. mute it. I'll mute it anyway. Hey, Robert. Hey, what's up? No much. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, my alarm went off. I went, oh crap. That's when that's when you wake up in the morning. That's pretty awesome. Of course. <laughs> Should we oh we'll wait for a couple of a minute or so and then we'll go. What time is it? Uh seven oh one. Give it a couple more minutes. Yeah. Probably not too much more because remember we're uh, up yeah. against the limitations of the free version of Zoom, which caps us at 40 minutes. Sure. Hello. Hey, team. Robin. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yvonne. Hello.
Well, I'm I'm from Switzerland, so it's uh, I usually start on time. <laughs> um, so I'll say we'll give it a go, Jeff. Ready if you're ready. Go ahead yep. and pick it up. Well, a couple of rules of engagement. This is a, we have a, a free uh, version of Zoom, so we have 40 minutes for the entire presentation before they kick us off. We'll try to be uh, shorter than that. Uh, if you're not speaking, please mute your uh, microphone. Uh, we'll probably try to leave, you know, 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions and uh, an answer. So, um, okay. Oh, wow. We have Mike, Lee, Bob. Good. Everyone is joining. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, you guys know me, we know each other, so there is no need to do any presentations. We'll keep it simple. Uh, this is technically, I was thinking about it. Technically, this is a second meeting because we already had uh, a meeting last year in person at a Dixie Wing. Um, and then obviously uh, things have changed. So uh, this is technically, we can consider it the first uh, official meeting, although it's uh, virtual. Uh, which is actually a great thing, you know, technology is allowing us to uh, be, be all together in the same room. Uh, thanks to uh, Jeff Clark and Chris Madrid for helping uh, putting together this presentation. Uh, we're going to be quick. Um, I'll be very simple. I'll be the project lead. Uh, Jeff Clark will be the restoration lead and Chris Madrid as a development officer will be our wingman. Um, as you can see, we already have a logo. Uh, our friend Chad Hill, that the guy who does all our artwork, designed this beautiful logo, um, which uh, obviously brings us to the theme of the restoration. As you are familiar by now, we're always trying to tell stories. Please, if you um, if you are not uh, speaking, please turn uh, mute yourself um, because I, I can hear some echo. Thank you. Um, as often we as often the CF in general does, and we do it at Dixie Wing very well. Uh, we're trying to tell stories with these, um, with what with our air, our own airplanes. Um, we have chosen to dedicate a restoration and the aircraft to uh, Rosie the Riveter. Um, you know, we were uh, blessed to meet uh, Betty Bishop, who made an impact on many of us. So we thought that. Uh, we could dedicate the airplane to the, all the other roses that help uh, throughout the war effort. Um, again, uh, we believe that in order to be successful in the fundraising and to, in our, our mission, we got to tell a story with these airplanes. And we have chosen Rosie the River. And as you can see, the logo shows a, uh, a, a cartoon version of Rosie. And I, I love the logo. I think it's, uh, it's uh, pretty and uh, we can, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can do well with it. Um, th this is a um, presentation essentially to show you guys what we are going to do in the next uh, uh, few months, obviously pending COVID-19. Nobody knows what's going to happen. So we have planned some activities and uh, as everyone will understand, things might change, including the July 18th in-person meeting that we have scheduled at the Dixie Wing. Uh, that might change. So for now, just keep it on in, on your calendar, July the 18th. And if we have to adjust, we will adjust. Um, Where is he from? I am from Mexico. Thank you. You're welcome. No, I'm not from Mexico. Can you believe that? It's okay. Um, so what was going to say? Uh, yes, July 18th, it's the next meeting. Uh, Whoever asked me where am I from, do you mind to mute your uh, microphone because we can hear everything. That would be uh, a favor if you could do that. Thank you. Um, so we say July 18th will be the next meeting uh, in person. And today we're gonna show a, uh, essentially it's a PowerPoint uh, that Jeff Clark has put together. And uh, so I'll pass the ball to you, Jeff. And if you want to, you know, Play your slides, go for it, and I'll keep the time. So um, I know when it's about 10, 15 minutes to go, so we can open the floor for questions. 
Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Mo. Yep. So for those of you I haven't met, I'm Jeff Clark. I've been a member of the wing for nearly 20 years now, and uh, I'm a sponsor on the LT6, and I'm a Stearman guy. I've, I've loved Stearmans ever since my, uh, my grandfather took me to the National Stearman Fly-In in Galesburg, Illinois, when I was 10 years old, and I've been hooked ever since. I've, uh, I've got a Stearman. I'm really excited about this project. I think, number one, it'll be a really good project for the wing. I think it'll let a lot of people get involved. I think, as Mo said, it's a great way to tell the story of Rosie the Riveter. And, you know, selfishly for the pilots on the phone, you know, there's nothing quite like an open cockpit biplane. And you throw a grass runway and a sunset in there, and it doesn't get any better than that. So I think this is really going to be a, a fun project for the wing. Um, you know, since uh, the CAF is all about history, I thought we'd start out with a, a quick history of the Boeing Model 75, which is the airplane that we're working on here. Um, you know, the predecessor to the Model 75 was, was created by the Stearman Aircraft Company. So Lloyd Stearman was the guy that started the company. He was a, a World War I float plane, float plane pilot. Um, after the war, he ended up working for the E.M. Laird Company out of Wichita, Kansas. He met a fellow by the name of uh, Walter Beach, and uh, they hit it off, decided they wanted to be in the airplane business together, and hooked up with a another obscure gentleman by the name of Clyde Cessna, and they started the Travel Air Airplane Manufacturing Company. And uh, had a handful of modestly successful uh, designs, but uh, ultimately Beach went off and did Beach, and Cessna went off and did Cessna, and uh, Stearman went off and did Stearman, and uh, the Travel Air Company got acquired by Curtis Wright. And uh, uh, Stearman actually had a decent decent run with uh, a handful of mail planes, did the C2 and the C3 mail planes, sold a few, few of those. Um, tried to get into the military trainer market with the Model 6, which Stearman himself actually designed, and uh, the military didn't like it. They said it uh, was too easy to fly, it had this big wide landing gear on it, so it really didn't have the ground handling characteristics that the military wanted for a, a good challenging trainer. So uh, they rejected it, and Stearman actually ended up leaving the company uh, the Stearman Company got acquired by the United Aircraft and uh, Transportation Corporation, which was owned by William Boeing, and uh, they they basically took another run at it. Some Stearman engineers got together and uh, took the Model 6 design because uh, you know, they could look over in Europe and see what was going on at this time, and they anticipated the military was going to need some pilots before too long. And uh, they took that Model 6 design, took the landing gear, and made it a little close together and a little taller. and you know, came back with the Model 73. And uh, the military looked at it and said, you're close, you've got the landing characteristics where we want it, but unfortunately your stall characteristics are way too benign and they didn't really like the way that it spun. So they slapped some stall strips on the wings and uh, ultimately produced what was the Model 75 for the primary trainer. And at that point, the military really liked it. The Army bought a bunch of them. They called them the PT-13, the PT-17, and the PT-18. Um, the PT-13 had a Lycoming 225 horsepower engine on it, the 17 had a uh, Continental 220, and then the PT-18 uh, had the Jacobs uh, 275 horsepower engine on it. So uh, the, the PT-13 and the 17 were by far the, the more prominent uh, models, and the Navy had the same deal, they called theirs the N2S. But, you know, today we call them all the Stearmans. Um, you'll also hear them called the Cadet for the Army airplanes and the Yellow Peril for the Navy airplanes. It's a little confusing because in the Navy, they'll also call the uh, Navy N3N the Yellow Peril, which is a similar looking but a different biplane. But all of that's a kind of a long story of, you know, why this airplane that we all call the Stearman isn't a Stearman at all. It's actually a, a Boeing airplane um, because the Stearman company was, was wound up with, uh, with Boeing there. Um, they built about 10,000 airplanes altogether, uh, about 8,500 actual aircraft, and then another 2,000 airplanes just in the parts. And when it got out of the, uh, you know, after the war, the Stearman biplane design was obsolete at the start of the war. So at the end of it, the military was ready to get out of the biplane business. And they just, you know, offloaded these things as surplus. And entrepreneurial people out there are saying, hey, for 500 bucks, we can go buy a Stearman. And for another 500 bucks, we can go buy a BT-13. And we can take that Pratt & Whitney 985 off the front of the BT-13 and put it on a Stearman. And, you know, for less than a couple grand, we can be in the crop dusting business. And uh, those Stearman crop dusters flew all over the, the Midwest and the Plains and the South after the war up until the 70s. And around that, there was this whole cottage industry that sprung up around, you know, maintaining and, you know, remanufacturing the parts that would wear out and just keeping these airplanes flying up until the 80s when the crop dusting business kind of moved 
moved beyond the biplanes. They started to get into the more the bigger, the turbine powered stuff. But by that time, people are starting to look at all these Stearmans and saying, hey, these you know, cool nostalgic warbirds and they're restoring the dusters uh, you know, back into the original military livery. Um, so uh, that's why there's still a thousand of them airworthy today is because there's this whole industry of crop dusting that kept it alive, this industry around maintaining them and keeping them airworthy. And now it's a fairly economical and practical warbird to own. So anyway, that probably a little longer winded than I should have been around the history, but I think it's a pretty cool story around why the airplane's as popular as it is. So this slide talks a little bit about how the airplane's put together. You know, I wish it were just a matter of snapping the parts together like that picture implies it should be. Um, but unfortunately, there's a little bit more to it. Uh, this picture is actually out of the erection and maintenance manual for the aircraft. And it really talks about how the airframe is broken down into its constituent parts groups. And when you look at this book, this is the way all the systems and components are grouped. And I think this is something we're going to need to play by ear a little bit. But if we get really good participation in this project, if we get a couple dozen people who are actively engaged in participating, I'd love to get to the point where we can form people up into teams to concentrate on these various groups. You know, Stearman, for example, has wood wings. If you're really good at woodworking, you know, maybe you're just rolling off our P26 uh, wing project, probably a really great spot for you to help out would be on the wing group, helping put together the uh, uppers and lowers on both sides and the center section and just making sure that those are all uh, good to go. If you're a sheet metal person, you know, maybe you could help out with the body group. There's all sorts of sheet metal up in front around the cowlings and uh, you know, all over the airplane, you could help out there. If you're a fabric person, you get to help out all over the place because this whole airplane's covered in fabric. So, you know, we, we really need to see how many people are actively engaged. If we end up with five people doing all the work, it's really going to be hard to break it down like this, but we're hoping that we get good participation and this becomes a good way to kind of structure the different work so we can execute all this stuff in parallel and make progress on the airplane more quickly. Now, in terms of our plan for restoration, th this is how we're thinking of doing it. This was kind of put together through two different sources. First is, as I mentioned before, the erection and maintenance manual. That's really the Bible when it comes to how to put a steerman together. Um, that's the way, that's, it's from Boeing when they created all the, the uh, guidance around how to assemble the thing, um, and it, it's really the right way to do it. Um, However, we've also taken some input from people who've done this before, and we're trying to make sure we're using um, the knowledge that they're bringing to the table and you know, take advantage of the mistakes that they've made in their restorations so we don't end up making those same mistakes with ours. But the, the other thing about this plan is it, it implies a degree of linearity, which is probably not going to be true. There might be parts of this where we're you know, still doing inventory and cleanup. There might be parts of the airplane where we're actually you know, ready to cover it. So we'll, we'll work this in parallel to the extent that we can. But in general, the first step is really just going to be, be see what we have. We actually have two separate Stearman projects. We probably have five of some parts and zero of other parts. And until we actually sit down, collect everything and inventory it and compare what we have versus what the erection and maintenance manual and the parts catalog says we should have, um, we're not really going to know if we have everything that we need uh, before we start putting it together. So step one is just do that inventory. As part of that, you know, as we're going through these parts, we want to clean them up. We want to make sure that, you know, they're serviceable. Some of these parts might need to be repaired. And we need to make sure that uh, for the parts that we don't have, we know that. So we can figure out how we're going to procure them or build them or whatever we need to do. So first is inventory things, get them cleaned up. Coming out of that, there's probably gonna be several parts that we've identified as missing, and there's probably gonna be several parts that we've identified as needing some attention. We need to basically go out, figure out how we're gonna procure what's missing and fix the stuff that needs to be fixed or build what needs to be built. From there, we've got this initial assembly and rigging step. And when I first saw this, I'm like, why the heck do you wanna put the airplane together before it's all covered? What's the benefit of that? And this kind of goes back to uh, you know, trying to learn from other people's mistakes. What we've heard is that if you try to put the airplane together before covering it, um, when you actually go to rig it, you might need to you know, take your flying wires or take your struts or your bracing and put them in places where you've got fabric, which means you would have to cut the fabric or potentially wrinkle the fabric, move the fabric, 
and all of that great fabric and paint work that you just finished is going to be screwed up because the position of everything wasn't right before you covered it. So um, the intent of this step is to just make sure that everything fits together properly and we know the position of everything when the rigging is set right. So when you cover it, um, you don't have those types of problems. This is also a good point for an, an initial airworthiness inspection the FAA's got to do um, to come through, see everything, and make sure that uh, uh, the airplane's being assembled properly before the covering actually goes on. Next step is to actually apply that covering. Um, I've not actually done this, but I've seen it done. It's definitely a lost art. It's incredibly interesting how this works, and I'm super excited about figuring out how to do it. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely a, an aspect of, uh, of art and skill associated with this, but uh, you know, seeing how the, the fabric's actually cut and laid out and heat shrunk and uh, how all the, the doping works around it is, is a really neat process. And uh, you know, I think it's something that a lot of people that um, may not typically think of themselves as airplane mechanics might be able to participate in and actually enjoy quite a bit. So uh, the covering process is around that. From there, everything's gonna get painted. Um, I've got a TBD here around the color scheme, but it sounds like everybody's leaning pretty strongly towards that yellow navy, uh, yellow peril paint scheme. So I think, you know, we've all but decided around that one. Um, there's a lot of markings and stencils that need to go on the airframe or on the, on the paint to make sure it's historically correct and accurate. So we'll put those on too. And after everything's painted, then it all goes together. So uh, really it's around assembly, rigging everything. And, you know, there's a, a final FAA inspection that needs to to happen there to get the airworthiness of the aircraft signed off to. And then we go fly. So that's a high level view of the plan. Obviously a lot of this is gonna be detailed out and potentially modified a little bit as we go through the process, but this is what we're planning for now. Said a lot, so I'm just gonna pause right now and see if there's any questions about this so far. Okay. Jeff, real quick, uh, you mentioned the paint scheme. Um, so as we, um, as, as you said, and I forgot to mention, we have two airframes. If you guys, you might remember, we got one in Carleton, Georgia, brought it back. We did a little history. Uh, we researched the um, airplane ID and it turned out to be a Navy plane. So that's why we thought of obviously the yellow paint scheme. And in the first page of the slide, the beautiful uh, photo of a steerman with a sailor cranking the engine, uh, our uh, yeah, that one right there. Uh, that's Corpus Christi, Texas. And the first airframe that we have, it is two or three numbers uh, after this bureau number. So they're very close to each other, and which made us think that obviously the yellow color will be uh, the ideal paint scheme. But uh, we haven't really determined the identity of the second airframe. So based on that, I guess we'll make a group decision and, uh, uh, and you know, we'll go from that. The good thing is that uh, there are two or three paint schemes that are really awesome for the airplane. And I, I feel like any, any decision we're gonna come up with, the airplane is gonna look good. Whether it's an Army or a Navy paint scheme, um, I think the airplane is gonna look awesome anyway. Cool. Hey Mo, it's Thanks Philip. Everybody. One thing I'd like to bring up is please, look into the STC, the second person up front, to maximize profitability on the aircraft. I'd like to you know, take a hard, close look at that. And therefore, engine choice may be affected. Sure. Um, so just a little bit here, just so you can kind of see what you're gonna get into when we start doing the inventory. The diagram on the left is fairly typical of the types of diagrams that you'll see in the erection and maintenance manual. Um, it basically has a, a, a blow up of the, the different parts that are involved and the various parts are actually indexed with those index numbers. Uh, what you end up having to do, some of the parts are big enough they actually have part numbers on it, so it's, it's fairly clear. But a lot of them you have to go to the drawing, look at the index number, try to figure out what part you've actually got, then come over to this, uh, this parts list in the parts catalog and look up to see which actual part it is. So this will actually tell you what the index number is. It'll tell, me, tell you how many uh, of that part you're supposed to have for this assembly. So this fun process is going to be what we end up having to do to take the inventory. So hopefully we get lots of people actively wanting to participate in this because it is a little bit tedious, but it's really critical to make sure that we've got all the parts as we go to put this thing together. 
And in terms of training you to do that, we've actually got several different sessions that we're, we're looking to tee up around, you know, making sure people have the knowledge around the process that we're gonna take um, for this restoration. And the first one is really around taking inventory. We've decided to combine that with the session around priming and prepping because you know, we've talked about it. We really think you're gonna be doing the inventory, priming and prepping the part all at one time. So we've decided to combine those two sessions into one. And we're looking at having that on Saturday, July 18th. So just a couple of weeks um, in the hangar at 10 a.m. that morning. Um, obviously, as Mo said before, all this is a bit tentative based on what goes on with COVID. So this, if we have to delay it, we might delay it, but that's the plan as of now. Uh, we're looking to have some other sessions around, as I said before, the, the lost heart of fabric. Um, you know, how do you do that? How do you cut it? How do you use the, the Stewart system is the one we're looking at um, in terms of the, uh, the dope and treatment of the fabric. That one is, uh, is good because it's really easy to work with. And it's also water-based. So if you've ever inhaled some of the uh, organic solvent-based, uh, you can appreciate the, the Stewart system because you don't have to wear the respirator and you're not gonna you know, kill everybody in the building if you're working with it. Um, so we're looking at having a session on that. Um, rib lacing is another session we're looking to have, which basically shows the process of stitching the fabric to all of the, uh, the, the flight controls and the, the lifting surfaces. You actually have to stiff it down to keep, uh, stitch it down to keep it from separating. And uh, there's definitely an art associated with that as well. We'll have a session around how to build the, the wings. Um, you know, we've got some experts around that already, so uh, hopefully those, there's lots of people that can contribute to that. And then the session on rigging a steerman, I don't think that's gonna be so much training, I think that's gonna be actually doing. Um, you know, if you've seen a steerman, it's a big airplane and rigging it requires a lot of people to you know, lift up wings and bolt them into position and jack up the airplane. And there's this whole process around it. So you know, I don't think that's really gonna be go training and then having somebody go do it. I think we're just gonna do the training and the rigging all in one session. But uh, this is what our initial thought is around how to uh, break down the, uh, the, the training part of this. We may add additional uh, sessions if there's other topics that become relevant where we need to you know, scale out a bunch of people to, uh, to tackle something. But this is what we've got so far. Hey, Jeff, it's Philip. May I please ask a question? No, please. Are you all planning on going with two ailerons or four ailerons? Or have we made that decision yet? Uh, it'd, it'd be the two ailerons, I'm, I'm pretty certain. I mean, number one, the okay. wings that we have already are two aileron wings. Um, okay. And, you know, I've, I've flown the four aileron Stearmans, and it's not really worth the difference. <laughs> a little bit better roll rate, and we're not looking to do air shows with this anyway, so. No. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. Any other questions? So, uh, next couple slides here, I just thought you guys might like to see a few pictures of, uh, of unloading the project here. So this was when we got the, the second project in from Texas. Uh, you can see the fuselage sitting in the shop. That's basically what it looks like today. Um, but that's the process of unloading it. The second one is a really good project. If you haven't seen it, you know, in the, in the realm of Stearman projects, it's, you know, as close as you could get as a, as a turnkey kit as I think one could expect. That first one we got was a little sketchy. There would have been a lot of work associated with that one, but I'm excited about this, this new one. I think this is gonna be something that if we can get the, the help and the support around it, you know, has the potential to come together pretty quickly. Um, and uh, here we can see uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, space. Uh, as you probably know, the shop right now has a lot of PT-26 wings in there. That's probably gonna be there for several months and we need a place to put all of this. So. Uh, Mo and a few others were uh, good enough to procure a shipping container and we filled those shipping containers with shelves. And what we're planning to do is actually put a coordinate system on those shelves. So as we're taking inventory, um, we'll actually be able to record with each part where we put that part in terms of the shelf that it's on. So this will give us a way to kind of organize the, the different parts as we're going through that inventory process without actually having the space in the shop. And hopefully those, those PT-26 wings will be shaped up pretty good soon and out of there, and then we'll have the whole shop to dedicate to this project. But for now, we're making do with what we have and the exact process around you know, how to you know, find what shelf and record what shelf you're putting the part on, that's gonna be exactly the topic that we cover during that inventory session. Um, and then finally, just a, a couple last points here. 
we've got a website for this project. Um, the URL is there. We'll send this deck out after the meeting so you won't have to remember that big long URL. But uh, if you do go there, um, take note of the PayPal link. You can donate directly to the Stearman project from that link. And uh, you know anything you'd want to give, we'd be glad to have because there's going to need to be a fair amount of uh, stuff that we need to buy to get this thing together. And then ultimately, we're having this uh, Living History Day this fall, September 26. This is going to be a good way to unveil the project to the public. We're going to have the Rosie the Riveter panel there, and I'm planning on bringing my steerman. I think a few other people will be bringing theirs too, so hopefully we'll have more than one, uh, so people can you know, kind of get up close and hands-on with the airplane. So that's really all I had for uh, the session tonight. Uh, Mo or Chris, anything to add before we take questions? Yeah, just a quick comment. And so Jeff and Mo, thanks so much uh, for putting this together. It's a great presentation. And for everybody else, uh, I think Mo and, and Jeff also and others, the thought of a Rosie the Riveter theme is actually one of the uh, one of the stories we were trying to develop so that the public could more easily connect with the project. Uh, everyone loves fighters and bombers, but for for some people, it's a bit of a stretch to relate to that. But when we understand that there were 19 million women in the workforce through World War II and aviation, the aviation sector was the most heavily impacted. It's a great story that allows us to connect with a big part of the population that, that today might find related to the CAF a, a bit of a stretch. That's a great project. I'm excited. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Chris. Well, I, um, as you can see from the pictures, I have not learned how to uh, restore an aircraft, but I did learn how to build great wooden shells, thanks to uh, <laughs> Jim Van der Hoel. Um, well, I, what I'm excited about it, uh, I'm looking at the, all everyone who joined uh, um, the, the presentation tonight and every single person who sent me an email several months ago, uh, raising, raising his or her hand saying, I wanna be part of this tonight are here, which is great. Um, one other thing that excites me is, is the fact that uh, I think none of us <clears throat> has any experience in restoring an aircraft. Um, which is could be scary, but I think it's also a good opportunity for many of our members who have supported the Dixie Wing uh, in different different ways in different capacities. And finally, they're able to put their hands on a restoration project, which is I think uh, important because uh, not everyone gets to go down and uh, and fly the airplanes or or maintain the airplanes. So I always hope with with pro with this project since the beginning. Um, we would have been able to include those members who don't always get to do, um, you know, any hand work. So uh, I'm excited about that. I see about 15, 16 people that sign in, which is great. Um, I've, uh, you know, Chris, Jeff, and I discuss a uh, very simple uh, rule of engagement. You know, if you're committed to this project, uh, please, you know, uh, help out. And if you can, that's fine. Just let us know. Uh, don't let your, you know, team members down because very often at Dixie Wing we have this bad habit of just because we are volunteers, we are not supposed to come through with our, I guess, obligations and commitments. And I feel like in a team, you know, if one person lets, um, lets you know, the team down, then, you know, things don't really go as uh, well as they should. So um, I'm trying to use my politically correct, uh, I guess, uh, way to say it essentially if you can make it that's fine just say it uh, if you can help that's fine no problem but if you say you will please commit to your you know commitment uh, that's all I'm asking um, other than that uh, I think uh, we are almost close to 40 minutes I believe Jeff I'm not sure if uh, we still have any any more minutes but well, if anyone I, I, it doesn't say on here that I can tell but uh, anybody have any last questions before we wrap up All right. Well, I just got a, I just got two things. I got a little message across my screen that said, uh, you've been upgraded. And I don't know if that was me that was upgraded or. Yeah, we use your credit card team. Okay. Well, it definitely hadn't been upgraded then. Yeah. Uh, the other question I got is have, uh, there's an organization I'm, I'm guessing we've already talked to, the Stearman Restorers. Stearman Restorers Association? Yeah. I bet yeah. you're that, ain't you? I'm a member of, of that group. That's a, they've got a great online forum. 
um, to be able to ask questions and everything. We've also engaged um, David Harwell, who runs Bardstormers Workshop and was restored, you know, half dozen Stearmans in his career. So we've got a lot of good resources around how to do this. But you know, as Mo said, unfortunately, as part of the immediate project team, we don't have anybody that's done it. But all the feedback that I've gotten is none of it's particularly hard, but there is a lot of it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just a lot of work that we've got to do and we've got the support there if we need it. Well, what I was thinking is they put out a magazine and I think in one of them I seen something about they uh, occasionally put, uh, you know, aircraft restorations in there. So I thought maybe one of the marketing people could look into that and maybe we could get some free publicity for them. Sure. Yeah, the SRA actually puts out a really good magazine. It's just for their members, but the quality of it's really high. So I, I think in terms of one, getting the word out, it's a good resource. And I think just number two, in terms of getting technical guidance and support, it'll be a good resource for us too. Okay. One thing I was gonna mention, Jeff, that right, you kind of uh, touched briefly. Uh, right now, obviously the hangar um, doesn't have any extra space for us, um, but I was able to craft, thanks to Randy, a little table that we have towards the, you know, the back of the shop, which we can use for the time being. Uh, I was told that those wings should be shipped back to Indiana or uh, whatever they're from um, within four to six months. As you all know, four to six months could be longer than that. So let's try to all be patient. Um, we all know that once we uh, those wings are going to be out of the shop, we'll take essentially uh, we'll take we'll take over and uh, we'll have plenty of room to to work around the airplane so we have essentially just had to be patient a little longer but that doesn't mean we can't go down at the hangar and start working in cleaning the parts and inventorying the parts so uh, we'll take we'll take baby steps but again we want we wanted to get things going because everyone is excited about this project and we feel like with everything is going on around the world with COVID, we need some positive vibes here. So this meeting serves as such, and the meeting on the 18th will be you know, definitely more entertaining because we can put our hands on the parts and we can show you what we have. And I'm just very glad that everyone is on board. That's it. Cool. Well, thanks, Mo, and thanks everybody. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mo. Everybody Appreciate has a good evening. Bye, guys. Good night. Thanks, guys.